Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We are super pumped to have Tom Story with us today to basically just break down his whole thing and what he's done and how he's gotten here today. Uh, I'm going to read his bio real quick. Tom Story is considered one of the top 35 realtors in Canada under 35 years old and is consistently in the top 1% of all realtors in the marketplace. He often speaks with national media outlets about Toronto and national real estate market. Tom has spoken all over North America about the real estate industry and remains on the cutting edge for information and strategy. Tom is your go-to choice when buying or selling in the downtown core. Yeah, I, I ripped that right from your website. So I love it. I love it. <laughs> Does it always feel weird hearing it read back to you? Yeah, normally or sometimes even people like kind of switch it around and they're kind of setting me up with high expectations. I'm like, maybe like tone it down a little bit, right? <laughs> so so if someone doesn't know you, can you can you kind of just tell us about your journey about how you kind of got to be where you are today? Uh, so maybe how you got in the business or just that whole thing? Yeah, totally. So I, um, this is all I've ever done. So I, I got my real estate license in fourth year university. I went to University of Guelph, um, studied sociology. I knew from like basically second year onwards, it was just going to be a degree and I wanted to go into some type of sales. Um, when, I, when I finished, basically, I did the little bit of the Euro trip thing. Once I got back, I was all in on real estate. Um, that was now, I don't know, eight and a half years ago. Uh, so I started at 22, um, really the first six months of trying to be a real estate agent, I failed miserably. I was certainly not a natural out the gate. I, th I think I, I remember actually very well, like the first six months, I think I'd made like $8,000 total. And I remember thinking like, I don't know if this is going to work. And even though at the time I was living in my parents' basement, it, I was like trying to crunch numbers. I'm like, how do people do that? Like, it was just so frustrating to me. Right. And that first year, I think that I... It was actually a good thing because I learned all the things not to do and I was running around everywhere, just trying to meet people, um, wore a suit and tie every day just to make myself look kind of older than I was. And it's like at the time, even my friends who trusted me couldn't afford to buy real estate. Their parents looked at me as like the kid that used to come over and drink in their basement. You know, it was like a very tough start. Um, so like I built my business, like my, my entire database from scratch. Uh, from doing leases in downtown Toronto, from running ads on Kijiji and Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace and just hustled as hard as I could. And by the end of that first year, I, uh, I think I ended up doing three sales and like 40 something leases, but I was like, I could, I survived, you know? Um, and then uh, right after that, I kind of got more aligned with, with coaching companies and structure and treating it truly like a business. And that's when things really, really click for me. And then just to fast forward to now, uh, I'm 30 years old now. Uh, I run a team of six. Um, uh, we've, we've taken it from, you know, three sales in year one to 126 last year. So we've really kind of grown it out now. And I've been through every kind of phase, I think, in terms of like alone, try to build the team, not know what I'm doing, then keep going and then only work with, and then no more leases, only buyers, and then no more buyers, only listings. And then, so lots of trial and error throughout the, uh, the last eight years, but uh, it's been a lot of fun. In those, in those early years, uh, when you transitioned, sort of found coaching and found training, you know, tell us a little bit about that, because that's really interesting for people starting out. You know, usually you go to, you know, Rich Robbins or Buffini, you know, and, and you're like, whoa, there's like a lot of stuff here. And then you, you know, you, you try and do it, it all. It, this is my journey. <laughs> and yeah. then, you know, it's sort of bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller. Like, tell us a little bit about how you landed on that. Well, I remember actually going to a conference and sitting in like the back left row by myself and just kind of observing and the people that would go up and the panelists when they would talk about their business, like I just couldn't comprehend the type of numbers they were doing. I, I just, I was like, how is that possible? Um, and then what I realized is like, they're all doing the same things. There's no secret here. It's just following the system and having some patience behind it. And it was overwhelming. Cause I remember like you leave those conferences with a list of like 20 things you want to do and you never do any of them. And the biggest thing for me was at the end, it was, it was a rich conference. It was RI. And he was like, just take one thing, like write down one thing you're going to do. And I remember like in capitals, I wrote my little book, like video, because no one that I saw was, was really doing it at the time. And, and I really think that in terms of a visibility standpoint, 
uh, that's what really helped my career. And then building off that with the systems and structure and having someone to be accountable to. And, and how long ago was that? Do you like roughly, do you remember? Uh, that was probably or like either late 2014 or early 2015. And you've been basically right. pushing hard on video since. Yeah, my whole thought process on video um, is that there are a lot of realtors that are really great at video, but don't sell a lot of properties. And it's an ego trap that you can fall into. So I thought like, okay, if I'm going to do this, this has to actually be built into the business model. I need to figure out the types of video that are going to attract people to call me. Like what if, what if like my phone only took incoming phone calls, right? That's like a Dean Jackson thought. Just like, <laughs> what if your phone just rang? Um, and, and then my favorite line, like at one point I will write a book called this is visibility beats ability where it just, it doesn't matter how good you are at what you do. If nobody knows and especially in those early days, it's like, I knew if I could get a seat at the kitchen table, I know I'm good at what I do. And there's all these people doing 10, 15, 20 times more business than me that aren't 20 times better. And I was like, well, what's the problem here? Right. And so I just started putting myself out there a lot of trial and error. And, um, and just to be clear too, like when I say visibility beats ability, I don't actually think it's more important. It just comes first. So it's like, it doesn't matter if you're great, if you can't, if they don't know who you are. And the thought process is, so like, what's like a, what's like a community or neighborhood in Ottawa? Alta Vista. Okay. So if I'm a homeowner in that community, how do I know who Matt or Jody is? That's what I, that's what I was thinking. I was like, how the heck would people even know who I am? This is the medium I have that is free. I might as well try and take advantage of it. Uh, so you, how has your vision for video changed over the last couple of years, right? You've, you've been doing it for, I'd say long enough now that you you've adapted and you've learned things and it's probably shifted. How, how have things changed in the last few years? Yeah. So when I first started, I spent a lot of time doing like market update videos and that was kind of my thing. And, and every month I would send a market update to my database and the first little while it got some pretty good traction, but then you realize it's kind of just dull content. It's like, if someone really needs it at that moment. But um, otherwise, why would someone watch it unless they're like really into real estate, which is a small percentage of, of, of clients, right? Um, so it started from, from that and thinking that YouTube was just a place I put my videos so they'd show up on my website and that was it, right? And, and then what kind of changed to, to, to fast forward to today is like, if I were going to start with video right now, there are two avenues that I would take. Um, Instagram Reels. There is nothing more powerful right now. It is the most amount of exposure you can get on a platform that is actually mature, right? So you will get more views and more likes and comments and follows on TikTok. And I know a small percentage of people that are doing business from it, but not enough yet for me to go, okay, that's a guarantee. But for Instagram reels, like if you post on Instagram, maybe your followers will, will see it. If you do a story, they'll probably see it. If you do a reel, they'll see it. Plus they'll share it to 80% of people that you never knew existed. Um, and the thought process between the reels is because they're competing with TikTok basically, and you, I guess YouTube shorts at this moment is that you almost have to make content so simple that it's for people that could never afford to buy a home because you need them to like it and share and ask questions to get tractions for the algorithm to actually show it to the people that follow you. As weird as that sounds. So you almost need to make content not for your followers to make sure your followers see it um, because of, of the algorithm. So on the short form side, that's where I'm spending all my time right now. And, and what we have to remember too is 50%, if not more of our followers are just real estate agents anyways, right? <laughs> so so the, the thing that I never really thought about with video that I started to find is I started getting referrals from realtors and other marketplaces. Right because they're like, oh, you're the Toronto guy, like, uh, just because they, because Instagram. Um, and then on the People other side- you've never spoken to before. Never spoken to before. Yeah. No. Um, and then it starts happening with clients, which is really cool. And the analogy is like, they've been dating you online for six months. You just never knew. And then they reached out when they were ready, right? Um, and then long form, uh, nothing is more powerful full than YouTube right now. Like, it's insane- um, we're putting out one to two videos a week and, and videos that are not, here's the five reasons why I'm a great realtor. Cause frankly, no one cares. It's here's the most five affordable areas in Toronto. 
You know, here are the things that would actually need to happen for prices to cool down. Here's what I wish I knew before I bought my first property and making it market specific. And because the true ROI with, with videos is not views, it's not likes, it's not comments, it's appointments book that turns into sales. Because at the end of the day, we're running a business. Um, so, and, and, you, and you love that. You've got like a sign in your office or a ton of signs in your office, yeah. right? That are like, have you booked an appointment today? I don't know. I forget what they say exactly, but you've got something like that, right? Yeah, because if my team comes into the office, we're not there. Like, obviously, we're there to have fun. And, and we're like, if you're there, you're there to book an appointment. Like, the only three things that matter is meeting with new buyers, meeting with new sellers, or showing properties. Those are the three things we should wake up and try to do. If we don't have any of those things booked, then you should do all these other things to try to get one of those things. Yeah. yeah. Okay, what's so, the, so uh, what's, yeah. The sweet, uh, what's the sweet spot on your long form? So, is mm -hmm. it the length? Is it the day? Is it the time of day? You sure. know, what's like, what are some of the keys that you really like woke you up to? This is how it, this works. Yeah. I mean, there's some pretty straightforward stuff like on YouTube, like you have to make sure the keywords are actually what your content's about. The, the thumbnail and title does matter. The same thing. Like you have to play the clickbait game to get people there and then show them that you know what you're talking about. Um, I find posting on Sundays is the best for me in terms of YouTube videos. Um, or Tuesday evenings is also really good for whatever reason. That's kind of the two days I post on. I try to keep the YouTube videos like five to seven minutes uh, so it can keep people. But what changed for me on the YouTube videos was in the first 30 seconds of every video, it will be, hey, also, I'm a real estate agent here in Toronto. And if you want to book an appointment with me, there's the first link in the description. And I have like a thing going over the screen showing them booking an appointment on Calendly. And since I started doing that, like, I'll probably get three or four appointments a week from YouTube. Wow. And we've already closed three sales from YouTube this year. And that's coming to you. Directly to me. Yeah. That's, but that's, but that's, that's coming in, right? Yeah. It's not, it's not you going like, it's, it's them just, Hey, we want to work with you. We want to work with you. And it's so funny because when, when they reach out, the conversation is not like, Hey, we're, we're hiring. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're interviewing all these realtors. You're right. one of them. It's like, Hey Tom, we've been watching your stuff. They like quote what I say in the videos and they're like, just happy to chat with you, which is such a like comparative to what we've learned about online leads. Like these are not online leads. These are people that are serious. And, you know, some of them just want free information, which is fine. I'm happy to have the conversation, but a lot of them are like, we like your style. We want to work with you. And that's the thing. It's like, the first three to six months of doing this stuff, it's like talking to a brick wall. No, like nothing's happening. And then one day the tipping point happens and it starts coming in. So what's, what's COVID taught you about your, about things? Like what's changed since yeah. COVID or like whether it's video stuff or, or just real estate stuff. I think what COVID did in general for a lot of people is just put like life in perspective. Right. And, um, for me specifically, I think before COVID, I was, this is going to sound weird, but like I was just a realtor. I associated with that's what I was and that's what I did. And I was obsessed with it. And I think throughout COVID, I became more of like a business person that happens to run a real estate team. Right. Um, and it, it kind of gave me just like every decision that I try to make, at least like, obviously some things are going to be reactive, but I try to take that bird's eye view, like kind of sit back and and, and think about what I'm going to do. And I remember when, if you go back, right, to like March 2020, when everything was happening, I sat down at the kitchen table, you know, with my partner and me and her talked about like, okay, how long can we last based on our savings if I make no money for the next six months? Because yeah. at that time, like... We all had that same conversation. Yeah, what if only, what if nothing that we sold closes even? Right. What if right. all that gets like, whoa, what and, if, forget the new stuff. Yeah. And then what it realized for me was I only, my life is fueled only through income from real estate sales. And I needed to create other passive streams of income. Um, so that's why I launched a course. I invested in more real estate. Um, a few other like minor things that pay me like small amounts of money, like YouTube crypto, AdSense. crypto. Yeah. I have some, I have a little bit of money, but I don't play much that game, but I just realized like, listen, if I get sick or something happens, is my business even worth anything? Right. And at the time the answer was no. 
And now I think there's enough of a structure behind it that like I could go away for two months and we would be totally fine in terms of what we're doing on the sales side. But it was to answer the question, I know this is like a long answer, but it made me go from like, okay, the real estate funds and earnings go into an account that is used to invest in real estate. And I'm trying to live my lifestyle just on the other passive income streams. Is that a, a profit first uh, thing? Not so much. No, like, okay. I mean, really the biggest one would be just like I invest in a lot of real estate. So that's all capital appreciation, which is cloud money at this point. But it's just the being able to sleep at night thing where like, I know every conversation I have with a client, I can give them transparent, straightforward advice because yeah, it's not going to change my life if I sell their property. And it makes me feel good about it. It's, uh, I think the pressure is really starting to come. You know, the real estate markets are challenging. There's more than a hundred thousand agents in Ontario now, you know, even Ottawa where, you know, we used to be, you know, I, I call it our a boring real estate town, you know, it was, you know, pretty balanced for tons of the years that I traded all sorts of, you know, easy, everyone was happy, you know, it was fine. Everything was fine, stable. And now I feel like, you know, there are some ages I think that are going to start to struggle <clears throat> with the transition. And I think transitions have been happening all the time, but this one's going to be hard that people are going to feel this for the next little while. You know what it is too? It's like, it's just been, we've been so fortunate to be in this industry over the last two years compared to a lot of what other people had to deal with. And a lot of realtors right now are, are just order takers. They're just doing what they're told to do and it's going to work because the market's good. But, and it's almost like a bad thing because in this type of market, unfortunately, your cousin's niece can sell the house. It will sell, you know, but I love 2020 for condos because condos in Toronto sucked in 2020. They went down 15%. I took over more market share than ever. And I had people being like, I need someone that knows what they're doing. Right. And, and when that happens, it's going to be very interesting because the way things are now, I think like us in the industry are worried about it. That's a telling sign. It's like this, can, this has to relax. And I think at some point it's going to, it's going to switch. And it'll be very interesting. I, I mean, so yeah, let's talk about the market, I guess, for 10 seconds, you know, sure. Toronto has been on a straight line up and we've been watching that from the Ottawa side of things where we, again, you know, 5% appreciation, two, three, five, you know, a big year seven, we're like, wow, that's a big deal. And now we're, I feel like we've caught up, you know, in 2021, I would get a call a week from someone from Toronto saying, I'm going to sell my townhouse for 1.5. I'm going to come and buy a place in Ottawa. It doesn't even really matter if I have a job. One of us can work remotely and the other person, you know, the metrics just say we can live for years without ever actually having to worry about this. Now I want to get a call. Uh, oh, how much, you know, I'm going to sell my townhouse for one, one. Oh, our townhouses are 900. Oh, wait, uh, did I call the right number? Is this Ottawa? Yeah, it is Ottawa. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I got to go. And they, and now they're gone. So, you know, like what, what is the future? What's, what's going to happen with all this stuff? What's, the well, perspective there. you know, what I used to always talk with sellers about is like in the Toronto market, it was like, you know, there was a period of time where it was like, how do you find the foreign buyer for my property? Cause the, the, the mythical thing is they will pay more money than anybody else. And there's always that, that type of buyer. And it's just like anywhere outside Toronto. It's like, how do you get the idiot Toronto buyer to come buy my house? <laughs> because they, because it's relatively cheap to what they think. Right. And like, it's happening in Alberta right now, right? Like Calgary's going nuts from Ontario buyers, not just Toronto, but Ottawa as well. And, you know, the saying that we used to always use was like the, how far did you have to drive to qualify for the property you want? Like drive till you qualify everywhere else caught up like Toronto over the last two years, I think is up 36%, which is still like crazy, but like Clarington, which is like kind of Durham region just says 98% in two years. Like these little markets that had influx of city money go into them. Um, at some point are going to have to hover or have corrections. I don't think they crash, but I think they have corrections because it's just not stable. And Toronto's starting to look like kind of reasonable again, which is crazy to say based on what everything else has been doing. But how did you deal with that? Like, like you know, like, like one of the questions we were going to ask was basically how did you handle those throughout, yeah. right? Because that's what we're dealing with now, I feel. Yeah. Right. So how, but how did you, at the time, how did you give a buyer confidence that, well, you know, the, the market is the market. You need a house to live or like what, what, what were those yeah. kind of. I, 
I'm kind of like a long-term stats nerd guy as well. So I have this chart that I love bringing out for Toronto, which is the last 40 years of, of data. And it basically shows in the last 40 years, there was a crash in 89 that lasted till 96 in terms of till prices caught up 2008. And then the second half of 2017, when fair housing and uh, uh, foreign yeah. buyer and rent control came in and through all the ups and all the downs of the last 40 years, we've averaged about 6.7% a year in appreciation. So all the ups. So I talk with every buyer, like if you are buying, I want you to have a minimum five-year horizon that you're going to hold this property. And sometimes the winning offer is not the winning offer. It's the offer that happens to win because they are uneducated, but I, they're not a winner, you know? Um, so we break it down to three things. It's like, because I've been dealing with multiple offers for almost a decade, like it's just normal. And and with buyers, it's okay. If we're the only offer, let's go in at this price and see what they say. They're not going to take it, but let's give it a shot. If you're competing with two offers or 20 offers, I don't care. You're competing with somebody. This is the range we're going to have to be in. And my third number is this is the like, I'm giving you my professional opinion up to this. If you go over this, it's it's on you. Like we, I've given you what I thought. And sometimes sure. someone will pay that, but it's just making sure they understand that if someone pays that, it's because they probably got bad advice or they're on offer number seven and they're at like, screw it territory. I'm living here. I'm done doing this. So you just don't know who you're up against, but the market doesn't care what I think. It, it doesn't care what any of us think. All that matters is what that one buyer is willing to pay and to play the what if game will make you go crazy. Would you agree that the only bad advice you could have given in the last 10 years was just wait, things will get better? Yeah. Or, hey, sell and rent for a bit, and then we'll jump back yeah. into the market when it corrects. Because even though that's probably like logical advice based on a cycle of a market, it's been incorrect. Yeah. All over. Yeah, everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Let's, uh, let's dig into some marketing stuff. Um, what's one of your favorite marketing tips that you've got that you, that you like love right now? Okay. So this was a Dean Jackson thought again, like I, I love his stuff as well. Um, he, he said, if you get a bundle of a hundred leads for anything, like a toaster, uh, a house, whatever, 50% of them will buy that product in 18 months. Half of them will buy 15% will buy in the next 90 days. So really it's just like that marketing is a long game and I'm done bucketing people into this person said this, this person said this, it's either they're ready now or they're not ready now. That's it. And trying to run a system of marketing, which is wh whether it's, they're seeing my Instagram stuff, they're watching YouTube, they're getting my market updates, they're getting my physical mail flyers. It's like all the things combined. Um, I just want to make sure that when they're ready, they saw me that month. That's it. Um, because to try to time it out perfectly would be impossible. And I've had a lot of things recently where we always try to track where business comes from. And it's not just one thing. It's like the last two Connor listings I got, they're like, we got your flyer. Then we checked you out online and liked your style. And that's why we reached out. So it's, it's like a five prong attack of like, you got to have the website, you got to have the online presence. You know, maybe you, maybe you just have all the for sale signs in the area, whatever it is. It's like all these things together. So, but to answer the question, like marketing is very simple. It's very simple. The, just you're talking about a social proof factor though, right? You're talking yep. about, you know, the, the, the number of times you can touch someone in a different spot, you know, whether, whether it is the flyer and the signs or, you know, and, or website or video or, 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 right. Or even community events or whatever we used to get, get back to that or, or yeah. that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's the factor of those things. You feel it's the factor of those things. Like it's all, the, how many of them do I need to get to? Yeah, it's all those things combined. And for me, it's like, I don't care which one it was that worked. It's just right. making sure that we're throwing all the things at the wall that we actually know that stick. And if we go back and look at our business plan and we spent X amount of dollars on a plan that doesn't work, we have to take it out. Um, so just sticking with what we know works without trying to overcomplicate it. So you're okay. So I was digging for something and I, so it was a bad question. Maybe I wanted to hear about your QR stuff. Right. You're like the, you're like kind of like the anti Scott Stratton in a way. Cause right. Cause that's, that's, <laughs> well, so tell us about that. 
I think, but I think Scott just made fun of people for putting QR codes on digital stuff. Cause that's just ridiculous. Right. But, and I like Scott stuff. So QR codes were a decade before their time because originally they were going to be the future and then they failed miserably. Right. But now like your grandfather, your three-year-old, everybody knows how to use them because of restaurants and vaccine passports and blah, blah, blah. So all they are is a tool. That's all I'm using them for. So when I send out a flyer and I, I fly about 10,000 Toronto condos per month, um, we've been doing that for about three years and it, it still works really well. Um, we usually have a flyer that is like some types of stats on one side, services on the other side, and then a call to action that says, book a seller's consultation with Tom with a little arrow to a QR code. So they grab their phone, they scan it, and it, it, I, I make sure the QR code goes directly to my booking page, which I, I use Calendly. And then they book a listing appointment through that. And then I get it on my phone through a time that I've already agreed that I'm going to be available and speaking with my calendar. And it's so crazy because like sometimes I'll literally wake up and look at my phone and be like, oh, I have two more appointments this week. And it's the same thought process of there are different types of leads. This is a lead of someone that like, just like think it through, right? You're at your house, you get your mail, you look through it all. You don't throw mine out for some reason. You put it down, you take your phone. Like I vetted them already because I made it difficult. <laughs> and yeah. by the time they come through, it's like, this is someone that is serious and has reached out and is probably a, a high-end lead. Well, and Isn't Richard Robbins- when you realize, oh, carry on that. No, I was gonna say Richard Robbins said it the best about this is that it's giving the people the ability to be in charge about the process. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. But it's but like this is when you know it's a business, right? You did stuff a little later, you know, output. You know, so my calendar just has stuff in it. Wow, cool. You know, that's the that's the that's what we want. That that proves that this thing's turning into a business. Uh, and it's you know, years ago before your time maybe even before my time, but it was like um, the sweepstakes, whatever they were, consumer sweepstakes, where you'd get this envelope, huge thick envelope in the mail, lumpy mail was a thing back then. And then you'd open it up and you had to like put all these stickers, there was all these steps. Okay, so by the time someone did all that stuff and mailed it back, when they knew, you know, this person didn't do all this stuff to, to not be engaged in the process. That person gets, you know, a sale comes from that. So someone that's done all your pieces, it's the new digital way, but it's the same consumer mindset. If they've done all those things, they're pretty serious about having a conversation with you. They weren't just looking for, you know, how much did that one sell for? You know, this is a deeper conversation. And, and that's the thing, right? So like Matt, now we can transition to like, there's two main types of leads and it's understanding. Maybe you can quote what I actually said, cause I don't even remember, but. <laughs> what you said I it really you? well. You said it really well. I, I might not have typed it correctly, but uh, so, and I, and I just love it, right? Uh, there's two types of options. We can get people to call us because we're the gatekeepers to get them into the property, or we can get people to call us because they want to work with us and the property is secondary. Right. So it's like, if I had to choose between those two, I would take that they call us first. And for most of the stuff that we've talked about so far, whether it's the social media stuff, the YouTube stuff, the, the direct hard mailers, when they reach out, it is me and then a property comes next. And right, there's nothing wrong with realtor.ca leads or online leads. Like you can convert them and they're great, but there's another step to the process. So if I had to choose one, I would try to do the type of marketing that they want to reach out to you. And they're not, you're not just the door opener that gets them in. And then maybe you can convert them if they like you. Where would that start? Like, you know, it, you're, we're talking about attraction stuff, but where would, where would that start? Like, I, I'm assuming it's coming from a place of knowledge, right? But I, when I'm speaking to the camera in terms of anything I'm putting out there, I'm kind of thinking about like one person, right? That I'm talking to one person. And for me in my business right now, that's a person that is selling their condo and moving up to buy a house. Like that's a lot of our chunk of business. So when I'm speaking on Instagram or whatever, I'm kind of talking to that person. So you kind of have to like, think of like, who's the avatar and, and even like name them or like print it out and be like, this is the, this is my ideal person. Um, and then once you do that, they kind of connect with you and feel like they know you. Um, but like I said before, like, it doesn't just happen. Like it takes several months to, to create any type of traction. But if I would were to break down the difference between 
the people that are doing, you know, millions of GCI versus the people that are just getting by it's, it's patience with the systems. Cause I don't think fundamentally anything's changed in real estate other than the tools involved. At the end of the day, we're just trying to meet with people face to face. Like it's a numbers game. So there's the patience, there's the consistency of it actually doing it. Cause that's the hardest part. When you get busy, it's just, it's then hard to continue to run your marketing if you don't have a team behind you. Um, and then the execution on it, like the difference that I see from like, I'm in, I'm in a few mastermind groups with like very high level. And when they put out an idea, everyone on the call is like, okay, we'll have that uh, ready for next week. Like they just do it. So, and that's what I think is that's truly like the, the top of the industry to the bottom. It's not intelligence. It's like systems and strategy and, and, you know, looking at it like a business. So I'm a new agent. I just got my license. I'm maybe, maybe I've been in a month or so, so I know what I'm you know, kind of doing. What would, you, what would you tell that person? Well, first of all, the first two years are going to be like a roller coaster. And the no like, and trust that everyone tells you, they don't tell you that like people know and like you, but it's also going to take a little bit of time for them to trust you as, as you as this new thing, right? Um, and that when your friends and family don't use you off the bat, don't like burn bridges, like prove them wrong. Like it happened to me and, and I held my tongue and just kept working at it. Um, I really think structure is the biggest thing. So what I would, would do if I started again right now is I would write down the top agents in every marketplace and I would call them and say, I, can I have 15 minutes of your time? I just have one question for you. And I would ask them like, what's the biggest piece of advice you could give me? And I would get it. And then I would take all that. Cause if I look at my business now, my listing presentation, my buyer presentation, a lot of my ideas are just other ideas that are being recycled and I'm putting my own spin on them. Um, and knowing that the sale process happens like it's not just you get a lead and you're you're done it's like it's this long-term thought process where 95 percent of the time people don't need you it's but during that small percentage of life when they need to move or buy an investment property whatever you know why would they think of you and i really do think that getting in some type of coaching whether it's just accountability with someone in your office your broker your team leader a coaching company like probably saved me legitimately like five years of, of trying to think I knew better or like was going to make my own version of it. Like the systems are there and it's just up to you if you're going to follow it and execute on it. You've done a, a ton of work in the media. You know, I turn on the TV and I see your face. Yeah. Um, can you kind of dive into how that maybe started or how that kind of became a thing for, for you? Yeah. So, um, so I work for Royal page Canada. Um, they have a PR department, um, and they have kind of different spokespeople across Canada for different markets. Um, what's interesting though, is that, cause I got started in this three or four years ago and they kind of start you with like the newspapers. And then when they get comfortable, maybe you can get on TV or ra like radio and then TV. And, um, but what it really was is I was already making my crappy market update videos and posting them everywhere. So somebody there un unknowingly to me saw my stuff and was like, Hey, this guy's young and he, he knows what he's talking about. And it looks like his business is going, okay, maybe let's give him a shot. So all <laughs> it is, is like, like I said, visibility beats ability. If I had never made those videos, there's no way I would have ever gotten this opportunity. Um, and, and also with the media, it's very interesting. Like, the amount of times I can tell you someone's called me and said, like, I heard you on the news or I No, other realtors think it's cool. My client, my past clients might give me some more credibility, but people don't pick their realtor because they just saw me talk on the news. Right. Um, but I will say that it keeps me on my toes because I have to know what I'm talking about because what they don't like when you do media, they don't tell you the questions they're going to ask you. They're like, all right, it's a five minute segment. You ready? This is the topic. So you got to know what you're talking about. Um, and also just a piece of advice. If you ever get opportunities for media, clear your schedule and do it. Because if you say no, you're off the Rolodex. Forever. Yeah. Yep. I, you say, you say no one notices, but uh, when I see, uh, you know, I have a good friend up you know, a little north of Toronto, Sean Ziegelstein, you know, I see him on the news. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, it, it is that reminder maybe by accident and, you know, uh, Royal LePage is super deep in the media, you know, Phil Stoper on BNN and, you know, a, a big, 
widely quoted, widely recognized and respected in that space. You know, how do you how do you carve out your space between you know all of these you know these like they seem to me from over here to be you know pretty entrenched uh, like people in the media. Yeah, I, I, I realistically, it's probably because I'm like the backup. If, if Phil can't do it in Toronto, they'll call me. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm the, I'm, I always say I'm like the best second option for a lot of things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just like there are, depending on the release that they put out or what the storyline is going to be, there's sometimes also just so much demand from different media outlets sure. that one person can't do it all. Um, and the same thing to the media company companies, like if I tell our PR department that I can't do it, like, it's funny. I, it takes a few months before I get a call again, if I'm like on vacation or something, because they need, they need someone right now. now. Yeah. And they call you, they, they call you at noon and you're on at three, right? Like it's, it's, it's right it's away. Always, Sometimes there's immediate. like 30 minutes beforehand. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. So you run and, home and, and you get, get bumped order. a lot. Sometimes right. you're scheduled in, they're like, something else happened. We don't care about this real estate story anymore. Like you're out, <laughs> which is cool. It's fine. Do, do they call you? Like, do you see a pattern now? You know, are you the condo guy? Or are you the something, you know, do, do, have you, are you in a niche yeah. or are you like, is this a broader play? How does this work? It depends on the station. Like sometimes I'll go on just for Toronto or sometimes if it's like the national news, then you have to speak about Canada and kind of do some research on the other markets going in. Um, yeah, it, it just depends on what the story is. Like, I think they would pick different people depending on what the story is going to be. Like I did one yesterday for the Toronto star, which was how 2022 might be the year of the condo. Cause they're the best valued properties, not cheap, but best value. And I think it's because literally two days before I put something on my Instagram saying the exact same thing. And someone probably saw it and said like, Oh, he'd be good for that story. Right. That's super cool. Oh. Well, if I wanted so, to get, so, sorry, go, yeah, Joe, go. You know, Matt, carry on. No, I was just going to say, you know, what, what, do, what advice would you give to an agent who wants to get into that space? And, and I, I think I already, we already heard it kind of, but yeah. kind of drive it home, right? You mean just media in general or just video in general? No, getting into, in the, in the media, sorry, getting into more of the media stuff. If I, if I wanted to try and, and yeah, and do okay. That. Um, well, you have to know who are the people making the decisions. Um, so if there's a local writer in, in your market that writes all the real estate stories, like email them and say like, I love your stuff. I'd love to be a contributor. Cause if you don't, they don't know who you are. Right. Yeah. Um, or even like a lot of these reporters or big time real estate reporters are on Twitter and very active, start interacting with them there. Like there's a, another agent who I love, Nazma, who's at your brokerage, Matt. Yeah. She's killing it with this stuff and half of it's coming from Twitter. And well, she's just, so it, really the answer is you have to put yourself out there because if you don't on like small time stuff, you're never going to get the big time opportunity. Visibility beats ability. So, but there we go. Not, not by <laughs> a lot, but it, but it does, right? Uh, do you, Jody, any other questions? No, I, I, this has been great. Really good. Yeah. Uh, do you want to, do you want to talk, tell us quickly about your, uh, your uh, story, your video course? Yeah, for sure. Let me, I'm going to share my screen with you here. Cause there's actually just two points I wanted to make. Um, if I can get this open, just two slides I want to show you. Um, there we go. So well, first of all, I just love this, right? I always love showing this. Like if none of your coworkers are making fun of you, you're doing it wrong. Because I can remember when I started with video, everyone would literally be like, what are you doing? Like, that's not going to work. That's not how you sell real estate. And then a year later, like, what camera do you use? How do you edit? <laughs> Switch is pretty quick, eh? When it starts building traction. Um, and then this is what I wanted to hold. On. I'm just going to go through here to get to what I want to talk about. Um, the, the benefits of video, just to give a perspective, we've, we've chatted about a lot of this, but very quickly, you get to leverage your message. I posted a video last week on YouTube that has something crazy. It's like 200 and something watch hours, which is the equivalent to nine days of somebody staring at my face about me talking about my market. And I, I posted it a week ago. So it's like, it's just so crazy that I can speak to a crowd. I think it makes you a better realtor because if you're going to put yourself on camera, you better sure as heck know what you're talking about. Everyone's silently watching. We all creep online. 
So it's not just likes and comments. It puts you out of your comfort zone. And the 1% of the time rule is just that whole, like people don't move that often, but when they are, why would they think of you? And then obviously I don't have to remind you of visibility beats ability. Um, to kind of sum it up, I'll just put it at the end here and I'll bring it back up. Um, basically what I, what happened was when COVID first hit, I had had realtors reach out to me a lot saying like, can you teach me how to edit or how do you film your videos? And I was like, okay, let me just package this together. So I, I ran a course, we would do a live zoom every week. And then as the market started getting really busy again, I figured, okay, I have to adjust this slightly. So we now have about 225 members. Um, it's about three hours of training of the fundamentals of video. We, we just launched a second course for specifically realtors trying to get better traction on YouTube. So you can buy the bundle. If you put Tom 10, it's 10% off. Here's my QR code. <laughs> you can scan it as long as you're not watching on your phone, Scott, don't be mad. And, um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's just, it's like a cool space. It's a, I don't think everyone needs it. it it's a niche. It's um, I found some pretty cool results from the people that are actually doing it, but uh, yeah, it's just a fun community. There's a Facebook group involved with it. We have guest speakers come on every month, similar to, to this. Um, yeah. It's just a cool place. You want to up your game on video and you're going to be serious about it and actually execute. I know it will work for you. Is this a course or is this a monthly membership? Like are it's just a one-time payment. Um, one time. You get access to the course at your own uh, rate. And then there is a pretty active Facebook group where we all kind of share ideas and try to get better. Yeah. Awesome. So you're the face of the brand. And yes. you, you know, we talked about how leads will, you know, on your phone, there's meeting set. They want to meet with you and they want to buy a condo. Tell me about the, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in this over the years. Tell me about how you convert that to introduce the team. And to get them excited about working with the team as opposed to the person they've you know been watching for years and this is going to be my experience i'm going to go see these condos of thomas gonna be great oh but i'm not yeah so, so so the way that i've structured it is i will still do the initial call um to educate them and i think my role on the team now at least for buyers is is strictly education and and at some point in the call, not right off the bat, but about halfway through, I'll mention to them, okay, so the way that we run the team is that because the market's very, very hot in Toronto and things move quickly, I want to make sure that you never miss out on any opportunity. And because of that, we actually have two agents on our team and their, their full-time job is showing properties. So there will always be one of us available to, to show you. And then it depends on kind of the personality of the client and, and whatever. And I, and I very much will. And the truth is my agents on my team are better at being buyers agents than I am today. Cause they, cause they've done, I haven't done it in two and a half years. Um, they're better than me at it. And so it's, it's like how you, you, you present it. It's not, Hey, you're, you have, you're going to work with this person. Cause I'm too busy. It's, Hey, you're going to get to work with our senior buyers agent, Morgan. Uh, she's awesome. Like you can check out her reviews on our website, blah, blah, blah. And I've literally never had anybody say, Oh no, no, we need you. Cause then if, and if there's ever any slight pushback or hesitation, it's okay. Don't worry. You know, my value to you is certainly not opening the doors, but when we get to the point that you want to make an offer, um, I'll, I'll jump in on the call and we'll run strategy sure. together. Cause that's where I think my value comes from. That's awesome. Yeah. I, th I feel like that's the right I think that it's not just an automatic handoff. I feel like you still owe these people a conversation. You still have to invest the time to explain how it works. It has to come from you. And, and halfway through, they love my team members so much. They don't even need me when it gets to offers, right? Because it, it's really funny how it works. But I always make sure like at the beginning, throughout the process, I'm texting, making sure everything's yeah. up to par. And then at the yeah. end, they're still going to get a congratulations video from me and the other agent on my team uh, to make sure that they know that we're all involved. That's amazing. Thanks for that. I, I really. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. I know this has been, this is really, really interesting for me to learn more about some of your, the stories that I haven't heard from, about you. So that's been awesome. Uh, but I, I just, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with us. Um, I know some of the agents here in Ottawa are really going to appreciate that. So thank you so much for, for your time. I really do appreciate it. Thanks guys. Go Leafs. Go. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, <laughs>